Ah, hell. I'm in the wrong game again. Hello everyone, Nary here from Drake Wing Gaming, so if you know me on Twitter, The Gaming Dragon. Today I'm coming at you another Let's Play episode of Changeling Tale, Marion's Path. So the last place we left off, we had just come with Grand to church, and I don't know if this is going to change the sermon at all. Uh, it might. I think Marion is going to show up instead of Grace, or I know Jesse didn't show up at all in the other one, because there was no church scene with Jesse that I'm aware of. But anyway guys, let's jump right back into it. Please... Sit back and enjoy for the next 20 minutes. Let me entertain you. And alarm chain, you're up. All right, let's jump right into it. <clears throat> okay. Despite our best efforts, we arrive late to the sermon. Gran and I quietly shuffle in, taking a seat in the back pew. She seems to be in good spirits, thankfully, and I suspect she's just happy to have someone to join her since Gran died. <sighs> I try to shake the bleak thought from my mind, but it's not easy. But must they play such dirge like music, and everyone looking so solemn, like they're attending a funeral? There's Marion sitting at the front by the altar, looking much like she did in school, attentive and giving it her all. Her sisters are conspicuously absent. Barely visible through the crowd, I spot a familiar floppy cap too, so the hat girl is local. I wonder if I should say hello after the sermon. Bulgar is chatting quietly with the cheesemonger toward the back, practically oblivious to the, of the lecture. I suppose at his age he's heard it all before. Sometimes I feel the same way. The preacher's voice is at once stern and hoarse from knowing God's truth. He's been speaking it every Sunday for the past 40 years. I remember a lot of these sermons from childhood, biblical tales of strife and longing, being cast aside, yet finding the good choices and following in Christ's path. Last spring, when I held a wounded man in my arms, I thought of Joshua, tasked by Moses to command the Israelite militia after fleeing Egypt. I didn't know who this man was, a commander from some other unit. Who would lead their militia if he were to die? Who would be their Joshua? Who would save his men from the next oppressor? The officer struggled to breathe and finally quit, giving his life for his country, for me. Shrapnel fell in circles around me, giving off violent sparks and deafening rips against rocks. It was like a million shrieks seared into my eardrums. Ladies and gentlemen, I ask you to join me in prayer. I bow my head, clasp my hands. My eyes are closed, but the memories linger in plain sight. Dear God, what a privilege it is to welcome home the heroic men of this great war. These men who survived unspeakable hardship and showed unfathomable strength against merciless aggression. These men who return when many others have not are our saviors too, dear Lord. With your strength and our strength we have beaten down our enemies. In this crusade against the godless invaders, you have favored our Christian Scott brethren, our humble children of God, who serve thee tirelessly. My clasped hands are squeezing tighter and tighter. I feel my fingertips crushing my knuckles. This sermon is false and mocking. Every word tightens my chest and brings hot tears to my eyes. There's nothing Christian about killing fellow men. Nothing heroic seeing a human body sliced apart. Brutality may be biblical, but it is only hellish and demonic. As if the pew is clamping down, clamping onto me and won't let go. Tighter and tighter it squeezes. And so I beg of this congregation to thank our father, his son, and our blessed sons of Ecna Craig, who've returned from the ravages of war. Thank them for all they are, and for all the goodness and power. May they always prevail and give glory to thy name. Hmm. That didn't go over well. Hey, fuck this shit, I'm out. The sermon continues, but I'm not there to hear it. I silently exit the church through the back door, relieved to be out the open air again. A few concerned faces watch me leave, but I don't care. It takes all my focus to push all my current rage away, burying it deep somewhere beneath a breaking heart. H hey there. <laughs> that girl. Effie. <laughs> I look up and see the girl from the pub, the sweet girl in the funny hat, which she's still wearing. That first friendly face on my first evening back. Hello. Hello. I'm sorry I was just getting claustrophobic in there. Did my exit make a scene? No, it's fine. I just wanted to make sure you're all right. It lifts my heart that a near stranger would reach out. It's awfully kind of you. Say, thank you for the warm welcome at the Stag and Annie the other night. You remember me? Yours was the first kind face I'd seen in a long time. Yours as well. Even having been here a while, it's been hard making friends. I can sympathize. It's a very small town. You know, I really appreciated your kindness. You seemed like a popular fellow that night. Otherwise, I would have chatted with you a bit more. Well then, thank you for saying hello today. God, forgive me. We've not had a proper introduction. The name's Malcolm. It's a I'm Effie. It's nice to meet you. Very nice to meet you as well. When she smiles again, my soul feels lighter. Another stranger who I want to talk to, to confess my troubles to, but something is nagging at me. Who is she really? Do 
Do I know you? You look so familiar. Her face lights up, but she frowns. I doubt you remember me. We crossed paths a few times before the war, but I never introduced myself. Her sideways smile is warm enough to melt cold butter. It softens the pain in my chest, even if unintentionally. And here I thought I knew everyone in town. I usually keep to myself. I guess I get a little shy around people. I know what you mean. Now that the lads are coming home, all the attention has been a bit, has been a bit overwhelming. Unwelcome. No, it's just... I take a pause, not knowing if I should be frank. Be honest. Effie's presence is so inviting that it somehow gives me reason to speak candidly. I'm no hero. I'm just a lucky survivor. I don't deserve praise, and I certainly don't need, un need unwarranted pageantry given by someone painfully ignorant of the horrors of... I stop short of saying war. This conversation ought not to get as dark as what I've just sat through. After all, Effie and I have just barely met. Well, suffice to say, there was nothing glorious about the last four years. I can't fathom how others can hear that vile talk and not be ashamed to agree. Effie doesn't hesitate in responding just as candidly. Malcolm, I imagine that people who haven't experienced certain things, well, they might not know how to talk about them. I don't know what else they can do to comfort those who have been hurt except, well, try to honor the survival of those closest to them. Effie shrugs and looks around timidly. It's just a thought. I may have no idea about the thoughts of others. I respect your pragmatism, but I'm not in the right frame of mind to concede that the nonsense I've just heard is anything but delusional patriotism. Honestly, I don't quite know what they should do either. What do they know of battle? That's what I want to say. I notice I'm shivering, and I stuff my hands into my pockets to keep warm. Even if they, even if they don't know what you've been through, everyone understands loss. Her eyes fill with tears, but they don't fall. The others may have suffered too, perhaps even as intimately as you have. People mourn in very different ways. I want to retort, who here could possibly have endured what I have? But I'm stopped by Effie's soulful gaze. The reflection of my hollow stare in her spectacles makes me look away. My eyes fall upon a cluster of graves in the shadow of the church. Soberly, I wonder, is Granddad is Granddad's among them? She's right. Grand Bulgar, the MacLeods even. They've all seen their fair share of pain. No person is immune to hardship. But they have held on to hope as well. How? Where do we find hope after the after, after all that we've been through? I look back up to her. She seems to share a keen ability with my grand to feel around for the ache within me and attempt to soothe the pain. What have I done to deserve this? I think that maybe you should look to the intentions of the people around you. If you do, I think you'll find I think you'll find you have a lot more friends than you realize, who care more than they can express. Her words are reassuring. I hold on to that thought and and hope I'm able to believe to believe it soon. The least I can do is offer her the same comfort. Undoubtedly, the same is true for you. You've said you've had trouble making friends, but perhaps you've already have you already have more than you know. There are many women in town who I'm sure would be glad to take you under their wings. You're a smart and lovely girl. You deserve friendship. Effie turns bright red and looks at me with a face full of ambition and reluctance. Two emotions that fight against each other often. Two feelings I've come to know very well. Perhaps. Her cheeks retain the pink tinge of timidity, and her shyness makes me smile. If only she knew how adorable and charming she is. Of course, I keep those thoughts to myself, as I don't want to embarrass her further. Uh, in the meantime... I'd say routine helps the most. That's why I, that's what I try to do. Routine distracts me from my negative thoughts on all I can't do, all I don't have. But focus on what you can do, what you do have. Don't ignore the pain, but please, don't let sadness overtake you. You'll adapt, heal. Life is a gift. Live it to its fullest. I'm taken aback by this candor in my, th in my throat ache, and my throat catches. I refuse to stifle the few tears that fall in front of this stranger, closing my eyes to her as if she inv she's invisible. I am somehow unashamed. I dry my eyes as clamor as a clamor coming from when the church is carried on the breeze. The sermon must have concluded. Effie looks towards the church, then back at me. The wind picks up and nearly lifts her cap off. She works hard to pick it back to pin it back down, laughing. I wonder what's under that hat you have. Probably some ears. <gasps> oh shit! I wonder if she's the cat. Oh. Oh, that would be interesting. I must be off. It was very nice to meet you with you, Malcolm. I hope we can find a quiet moment to talk again sometime. I can't let her go so quickly, especially after her words helped dull the throbbing burn of resentment. Effie, you have certainly improved my spirits just now. Please, Noah would make me very happy to chat again with you. Do take care today. <laughs> what a sweet girl. Yeah, I bet she's I definitely bet she's a romantic interest. The bell rings out, and I turn to see people begin to filter out of the church. 
Agnes emerges with Mary and looking concerned. They spot me and work their way over. And Malcolm, please let me know if you need anything. Your friends are here for you. The words sound truly heartfelt for someone I've hardly met. I turn back to thank her, but she is gone. She really is good at that disappearing act. <laughs> oh. Malcolm, you had us all worried. Is everything all right? No, everything is not all right. I'm realizing that no matter how much I try to put the war behind me, it may haunt me for the rest of my days. But if he is right, I'm not alone. I look at the two worried faces before me and know that there are people in my life who care. Yes, I think everything is going to be fine. I put on a strong face, and to my surprise, Marion takes my hands. Just know that we're here for you, Malcolm. You're a Campbell, strong to a fault. It's fine to feel weak and ask for help. I'm learning that lesson my own self. Sadness can be overwhelming, but don't fall down that rabbit hole. Aye, I'd have an awfully hard time yanking you out by your ears. You can't help but laugh at the image, and I'm thankful they've lightened the mood. Thank you, Marion. Gran. Come, let's get you home. <laughs> Adorable. The two women exchange knowing glances, then bid each other a good day. Agnes and I speak little on the ride home, but we don't have to. She holds me close, and I know that I am loved. Yes. Oh, so good. <clears throat> so good. Despite the debacle at the church, I feel closer to God, if only because I sit atop our house and the heavens feel almost in reach. Having all the roofing materials already together from the previous day, I set myself to patching the homestead proper. It's not in nearly as bad a shape as the stable was, thankfully. Ooh. Is someone at the door? Sliding myself to the edge, I look down to find Marion standing there with Grace. Marion, up here! <clears throat> Time to see some ladies. She tilts her head up and waves. Hey there, fella. We brought you a picnic lunch. Care to take a break and spend time with two fair maidens? Goodness, Marion is carrying an oversized basket, and I can smell the contents from all the way up here. I make my way down carefully, only stumbling a bit on the eaves. Standing behind Marion is Grace, looking more doe-eyed than I remembered from our last encounter. She's holding her hands behind her back coyly, but I can't tell whether I can't tell whether or not it is an act. Grace, you remember Malcolm? I stretch out my dirty hand and yank it back to swipe on my pant leg. Grace doesn't seem phased and still reaches out from my grubby palm, shaking it firmly. It's nice to see you. I'm sorry again, but that I don't remember you from school, though. Marion assures me we've met in a previous life. Shifting around, I smile. I smile abashedly. Ooh, a picnic. This ought to be interesting. Honestly, I don't have much recollection of you either. That was indeed a lifetime ago, those school days. We must make for two very forgettable folks. Oh, Cray. Oh, Cray, silly girl. <laughs> We all glance at each other. Marion caves. Fine, the two of you don't exactly stick out in the crowd. All that aside, let's eat. Hmm. Ooh. We're gonna get some good art. We're gonna get some good art. That's pretty itself. <sighs> Sorry about that. I take a few minutes to clean up, then let the girls lead me out to a hill in the open, open field under a small stand of, of alders. The leaves on the branches give good cover. It's such a marvelous day. Marion's enthusiasm is just, he feigned. Is it? How so? Naysayers, it's marvelous because we're sharing delicious food with a good friend. Grace marks at me and I break into a smile. Marion, you'd better feed us before we turn from forgettable good friends into unforgettable wild savages. Ah, <laughs> oh, God, the music really does help. Oh, man, the music really just completes the whole thing. The girls in pack smoked ham, oat bread, and a crock of fresh goat's cheese. I spot a berry tart and clotted cream, as well as a hearty supply of cider. Cider! Let's start there! She begins a rollicking afternoon. So it begins a rollicking afternoon. Grace is chattier than I'd have guessed. She can spin a good yarn and has a harsh sense of humor. She is open and honest, very clear about never liking school, and leaving as soon as her father allowed. I am an ascetic, a recluse. A recluse is a spider. Fine, then I am a spider, spinning my web like a spinster spins her twine. I'll use my web to catch invaders and my twine to rope them up and hang them. She's probably not kidding. And what will you do once you hang them? Eat them. Ha! Huh, with your tiny frame, good luck with that. A spider doesn't always eat its prey, often it simply mocks them. Then I shall also mock them. <laughs> then I have you successfully captured. 
Then I have you successfully captured. I've not a clue what a spider does, but I am good at mocking. You goose. Grace is laughing, so I don't think I've bruised her ego. Her banter goes on for what seems like hours. At some point, Grace tires. I really need to get back. I've enjoyed this time together, but home is calling. I'll buck you back. No need. I prefer the quiet, if you don't mind. Or e even if you do. Grace says goodbye and promises to join in on another, uh, on another altogether entertaining luncheon. Oh, just me and Marion, then. Hello. <laughs> She's a firecracker. She's a ticking time bomb. And you egging her on. Don't you know that's a job reserved for her sisters? <laughs> My apologies. Your hands must be full enough with her as is. Who needs their own children when you have a grace? She isn't a child. She doesn't need to be she doesn't need too much overseeing, does she? She needs guidance, discipline, focus. A good role model then. I try to be the best I can, but she needs fulfillment and I can't give that I can't give her. And she can't find and she can't find in the world. Is she looking? I'd say not. Does she need to? Yes, she's been a sullen girl since her mother passed. I never knew the woman. She died in childbirth over 19 years ago. Grace still blames herself, or more accurately, she thinks we blame her. It's not true, we certainly don't, but life with her is sticky. You need to watch what you say so as to avoid hurt feelings all, there, all around. She's kind when she wants to be, but a monster when she's in the right mood. What brings her joy? Anything? Just the outdoor, as far as I can tell. She'll sit out by the lock for hours. At times, I think she may have tried swimming in it, which is unbelievable. It's like an ice bath. I let her be when she goes to the shoreline. Can we change the subject? To Jesse? To not Jesse. And how about to you? To me? Yes, please, to you. This morning when you left the service early, I was hoping you were alright. I'm fine, I just... Well, it brought back some unpleasant memories. I understand. I hope the pastor's words offer some solace. That your sacrifice was not in vain. I want to believe that is true. I wish I could. I think the sermon was misinformed. This was not a holy war. It was merely a loss of lives. But all that fighting! It wasn't for nothing! We finally won! What did we win, Marion? What have you gained? But think of everything of all- Think of everything that we, all, we have all lost. At first, when Marion turns away, I think she's trying to avoid me in the conversation. But she pulls out a handkerchief, wipes away a few tears, and gives me a look begging me to continue. Tell me more, please. I will. Are you sure? Yes. I want to know what you've been through, what you've had to see and endure. Pain. Loss. Horror. How do I put these feelings into words without reliving the nightmare? Without putting my burden on the sweet woman before me? The lads were like brothers. They were brothers to me. We faced things people should never have to see. Civilization, humanity all stripped away. It was just you and the fellows beside you, unable to see, charging blindly into a gloom where they, or you, know you probably won't come out. But we faced it together and drew strength from each other, because we are family. Marion stares wide-eyed, understanding. The words come with increasing difficulty. I can hear their shouts, their screams. Tears sting my eyes like the, like the cordite from a hundred spent cartridges. I couldn't save everyone. It was never possible. Men were going to die no matter what I did. Even if I did everything right, it became rote. My throat is tight, my breathing unsteady. Your faces are still etched in my mind. Not one comrade forgot, unfor not one comrade forgotten. I lost brothers, Marion. I still don't know. I still don't know why or how I made it out alive. She reaches out and touches my fingertips. They are warm from the sunlight. You don't need to carry this burden alone, Malcolm. It will get easier with time. It certainly can't get harder. I laugh weakly, trying to rein in my sadness back in. Marion is in tears, too, but she smiles tenderly. All hardships in life come with pleasure and pain. You've had your share of pain. I expect pleasure has to be, has, has to be close. She stands up, holding my hand. Come, I want you to know you have a home here. Oh. I'm shaking as I stand. Marion slides both her hands up my arms and rests them on my shoulders. She pulls me into her, she pulls me into her and embraces me. Her comfort envelops me like a warm blanket. I wrap my arms around her and accept the tenderness given to me. Her body is lithe and soft, and she pulls away, keeping her hands at, the, at my elbows and her eyes deep into mine. The scent of honeysuckle wafts from her hair. Malcolm, I am here for you. Kiss her. Kiss her. Kiss her. 
The memories, the grass, the trees, the sounds around us, all fade away. All that remains is a magnificent woman in front of me. My heart races. I can feel my pulse in my chest. I'm spellbound. She's beautiful. Oh, God, she's beautiful. Suddenly, with a sharp inhale, she lets me go and starts tossing everything surrounding us back into the picnic basket. Is she embarrassed or indifferent? Has she become shy or cold? I'm so overwhelmed, feeling what's confused, excited, and scared. Marion, thank you. I'm here for you, too. I've... I've taken up enough of your day. I'm glad you can join us for lunch, Malcolm. That we could share this time together. Me too. Oh. Ah, oh, perfect place to end it. Okay. Oh, God, it's a beautiful moment. Oh, she's so warm-hearted. Gotta love Marion. All right, guys, that's another end of the ep that's another end of episode. This is another episode of Changeling Tale: Marion's Path. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Getting closer to uh, teaching her cowgirl. No, stop it. No, horny mind, horny thoughts, go away. <laughs> anyway, guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and ring that notification bell. And leave a super thanks if you can. It always helps. But anyway, I love you all. I'll see you in the next video. Bye bye.